Hi, my name is Zoe Gonzalez Izquierdo, and I will be presenting this paper, Ferromagnetically Shifting the Power of Posing. The authors are me, uh, Sean, Stuart, Jeff, Jiwi, and Eleanor, uh, and all of us are at NASA's Quail Group, and some of us also at USRA. In this work, we will be using a D-wave annealer to solve a class of optimization problems that require embedding as a test case for how pausing affects embedded problems. So for the last few years, we've been able to have some control over annealing schedules on D-Wave. In particular, the rate at which the annealing parameter S varies over time can be changed throughout the anneal, and it can be set to zero, like here. This is what we call a pause. Uh, we denote the pause location by SP and the pause duration by TP. It has been shown for native problems that an appropriately located pause can boost the probability of success. In particular, when a pause is introduced shortly, shortly after the minimum gap, where transitions are more likely to happen, we give the system time to relax back to the thermal state, which at this point has enough overlap with the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian that this increases our probability of success. There has also been some recent work on the theory side of this effect um, and how and when pausing is beneficial. And uh, now we are starting to look at how this works for embedded problems. So the problems we'll be solving are a uh, minimum spanning tree with bounded degree. It's a class of problems that typically requires embedding in a chimera graph. And uh, they also have real life interest as they apply to designing robust communication networks for aerial systems. So our real life scenario might look something like this. We have a number of UAVs or unmanned airborne vehicles and uh, they need to communicate with ground control but they might run into some interference and lose that direct communication. Our goal is to reroute uh, communication through other vehicles so that um, that route is optimal in uh, some cost, such as distance. And also each vehicle is only able to communicate with a limited number of others at each time. This is directly modeled by a minimum spanning tree problem with bounded degree where the weights on each edge uh, represent the cost of communication, like the distance, and the bounded degree represents how many other vehicles one can directly communicate with. Mathematically, if we have a graph with weighted edges, the minimum spanning tree is a subgraph, which is a tree, uh, which includes all the nodes of the original graph and has minimum cost. This can be solved in polynomial time, however, once we introduce the constraint uh, on the degree, it becomes NP-complete for an arbitrary graph. To solve this on a quantum annealer, first we need to map uh, to Cubo. And we have a cost function that we want to minimize, which is the sum of the weights of the edges uh, that belong to the tree. So the variables x, p, v are one if P is the parent of V, that is there's an edge in the tree between P and V, and there is zero otherwise. There are, there are several ways uh, of doing this mapping, but we chose a level-based approach, which means that every node is gonna be in a level. So the root node will be in level one, it'll be the only one here, its children will be in level two, their children in level three, and so on. So we have uh, a few constraints to ensure that this will be a minimum spanning tree. Uh, and they are that every non-root node has only one parent. Of course, the root doesn't have a parent. That every node exists at exactly one level. That if P is the parent of V, then its level is one less than V. And also that the maximum degree be delta. Now, because uh, this is a cubo, we can't have constraints. So we will express these as penalties instead. When we do this, we will end up with a few extra variables. So for example, from the uh, penalty that every node exists at one level, we will get um, y variables where y, v, l is one, 
if V is in level L. Uh, from the uh, constraint that if P is the parent of V, P's level is one less than V, we'll end up with several cubic terms, which we cannot directly input into D-Wave. So we will need to use ancilla variables um, to turn them into quadratic terms that we can um, use. And then from the constraint that the maximum degree can be um, delta, we will end up with some slack variables, z, v, j, which are one when the node v has j children. After mapping to Cubo, the number of variables will increase significantly. Uh, for instance, here, we will be um, seeing graphs which originally had five nodes and then after the mapping we end up with between 30 and 75 um, logical variables depending on the number of edges and uh, to create many instances we can use different graphs with different edges and then for each graph we will have uh, several sets of weights now, these mapped problems will typically not be native to Chimera, so we need to do minor embedding, where we use several physical qubits to represent a single logical one. So we have a very simple example here where a triangle is embedded as a square, and these two qubits are acting as what was previously a single node in the triangle. And we call the set of qubits acting as a single variable a vertex model. We have to choose um, a coupling uh, within the vertex model. And because we want all the qubits to act as one and to be aligned, we choose a ferromagnetic coupling, which we call J JF or J ferro. And then we also need to set its magnitude. It should be strong enough that um, the vertex model is unlikely to break. That is that the different qubits are unlikely to have different um, point in different directions. And for this, the extended range in the wave uh, is very useful, which allows us to pick a value between minus two and one. So our JFR will be between minus two and minus one. And uh, we also don't want it to be too strong that it makes uh, changing configuration too difficult because since all the qubits need to flip together, if, um, if J ferro is too strong, that becomes um, more costly. So we don't know a priori where that perfect spot is going to be, but we will look into that. Now, one problem with this extended range is that it prevents us from using the standard um, gauge averaging. Gauge averaging is a method by which we average out component biases that might be present in the qubits or the couplers. And we do this by solving the same problem many times, but each time applying a different random transformation to the couplers and fields where they can remain the same or change sign. Now, because the extended range is asymmetric, we can't change sign if we're within that asymmetric uh, part. And uh, so what we did was, um, use a different version of this method, which we call partial gauges. And since our JF is the only one that's in the asymmetric range and all the other couplings outside of vertex models are not in the asymmetric range, we just apply regular gauges to all the other couplings. And this is equivalent to doing regular gauge averaging on the original unembedded problem. And uh, it actually worked pretty well, as we will see in the next few slides. We first look at the standard anneal without a pause and uh, try to find the optimal J ferro. Uh, so we're going to use two different metrics. The first one is the probability of success or P success, and the second one is the time to solution or TTS. The probability of success describes how often the correct solution is found. So it's just the number of times we find the correct solution over the total number of times we run the problem. And it is useful because it tells us how good the parameters we're using are at solving the problem. Um, however, because those parameters usually depend on time, 
sometimes a higher probability of success can come at the expense of taking longer. So we will also use the time to solution, which tells us how long it would take to solve the problem with 99% certainty. And uh, a high P success, which is what we want, will mean a low time to solution and vice versa. So in this plot, we show the time to solution in microseconds for um, a range of different J ferro. And uh, our data points are the median of uh, bootstrapped over many instances, and the error bars correspond to the 35th and 65th percentiles. We find that uh, 1.6 gives us the optimal TTS, and that when we decrease the magnitude of JF, the, um, the time to solution becomes worse. This is because when the ferromagnetic coupling is not very strong compared to the problem couplings, it is more likely that the low-lying energy states um, are densely populated by states with an inconsistent vertex model. So in this plot, we can see how pausing and also gauges can improve our results. Uh, the x-axis represents the location of the pause, the y-axis has the probability of success, and um, then the blue color um, is used for results with no gauges, and the green color for results with gauges. Um, and then if we look at, at a single color, for example green, the horizontal line corresponds to the result without a pause, and then each data point uh, corresponds to a pause at the corresponding um, uh, location SP. So we can see how introducing a pause um, improves the probability of success. And like for the native problems, uh, it, this only happens during a short window. While if we pause too early or too late, that benefit is not there. And that optimal location uh, remains consistent across instances. Um, and like we said before, it happens shortly after the minimum gap, because after the gap, when transitions are more likely to happen, if we give the system some extra time to relax to the thermal state, that can lead to it uh, being more likely to end up in the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian. Now, as for um, why the gauges improve the results so much because these are the results without gauges and then these are with gauges so the probability of success is much higher. Um, running without gauges is equivalent to just picking one random gauge and then as we do more typically we would get some that are better some that are worse and that uh, usually evens out. However in this case because we start out with a very low probability of success and we have a lower um, bound at zero. We can't go below that. Uh, we won't have any gauges that are outliers in the negative um, direction. However, we might have a few outliers in the positive direction. So those will pull up the median and uh, we get what we're seeing here. And that is why using gauges um, was, um, was very good for our results. So in the previous plot, JF was fixed and we changed the pause location. And then in the one before, we didn't have a pause and we changed JFARO. But what happens if we change both JFARO and the pause location? Well, it will look something like this. Uh, this plot is for a single instance. However, it, it also looks very similar for, for an ensemble. It's just more clear um, to see this way. And uh, what happens is that as we increase J ferro, the peak in uh, the probability of success due to the pause shifts earlier in the anneal. This is because uh, when J ferro increases, the, uh, the total energy also does, which makes the minimum gap shift earlier. And because the optimal pause location happen shortly after the minimum gap, that shift is going to affect it as well. We can also see that um, for small J ferro, we see a drop in probability of success, which is 
uh, what also happened when we didn't have a pause. So, so far we've seen uh, how pausing improves the probability of success, but we also want to see whether it can improve the time to solution and under what conditions. Uh, like we mentioned before, even though a uh, longer time can lead to a better probability of success, it might not necessarily mean a better time to solution. And um, for, for annealing without a pause, it was actually found that the shortest time allowed, which is one microsecond, uh, led to the best time to solution. This means that if we want to um, maximize our, our chances of success and we have a certain amount of time to run the problem, it is better to choose a shorter anneal and repeat it many times than to go with a longer anneal. So what we're gonna do to, to compare is um, choose the optimal parameters for the no pause case, which is the, the shortest um, annealing time and also the optimal j ferro and then we will also zero in on the best post locations and durations for the post and uh, here we are going to show the instance wise improvement in tts and this is defined as for each instance we subtract the tts with a post from the tts without a post what this means is if this number is bigger than zero, then the pause uh, has improved upon the, the standard without the pause. And uh, then we, we show here, each data point is gonna be the median for, um, for a number of instances. So when a data point is above zero, that means that the pause improved more than half of the total number of instances. And we see that that's always the case. Uh, we have uh, several pause durations between 0.25 and 2 microseconds, and then we have two pause locations at 0.3 and 0.32. The data points are just staggered for readability, but like these all correspond to 0.3 and these all correspond to 0.32. And what we see is uh, that they are all above zero, meaning that in more than half of the instances, we see an improvement by using a pause. Uh, so, so this is good. We find that a short pause um, at an appropriate location will improve TTS. Now the improvement is not as significant as for native problems. However, it is statistically significant. Uh, and the reason that is not as, as significant as for native problems is that um, for embedded problems, changing configurations is more costly because all qubits within a vertex model need to flip together. And if, if that doesn't happen, uh, then the vertex model is broken and that solution will be discarded. Okay, so to wrap things up, uh, we have seen that embedded problems like native ones benefit from a pause, although not as much uh, because of the more costly nature of, um, of uh, changing configurations. Um, then we've also seen that the choice of uh, JFARO for the vertex models in the extended range, uh, as well as using partial gauges can improve our performance. Uh, we saw that the optimal pause location depends on JFARO um, because the, um, a larger JFARO will increase the energy and move the minimum gap, which determines where the optimal pause location is. And looking ahead, we are excited about the Pegasus architecture, which will um, lead to smaller embeddings, and hopefully we can see a bigger advantage for, for pausing. And we can uh, also explore different classes of embedded problems and also further our understanding of how the embedding and annealing parameters um, affect the performance. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>